So good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for our state budget and policy preview. Uh, this is, uh, we've been doing this for several years now. I always look forward to this second panel and the experts that we bring together. My name is Jonathan Kaplan, um, the se a senior policy analyst at the Budget Center, where I focus mostly on K-12 education, but as well on tax policy issues. I'm going to be the moderator for today's panel, uh, which we hope is going to provide a good look at what might be coming in the governor's 2020-2021 budget, um, as well as uh, state budget and policy choices that may be on tap and legislative proposals that the legislature may be considering uh, as they reconvene next month. Um, we also hope to focus on some key issues. Um, we know that California's budget is in good shape, but that many Californians are not. Um, the legislative analyst you know, recently came out with uh, some reports that show that we have a budget surplus and that the state's rainy day fund uh, is near its constitutional cap. However, we also know that many Californians are not sharing in the state's prosperity, uh, and we're, we, we need to think a little bit more about what that entails. Um, millions of Californians live in poverty. Income inequality has increased and persists. And a key reason why many Californians are still struggling is because we know that, high, that <clears throat> middle and low incomes have not kept pace with the increase in housing costs. So despite the economic challenges that are faced by millions of Californians each year, especially women, people of color, and immigrants, the governor has indicated a sober approach to next year's budget. Yet we know that policy choices can and do make a significant difference, and that increasing incomes or making basic needs more affordable um, can really help bring many people out of poverty uh, and more equitably share in the state's prosperity. We also know that California has, um, has space to generate additional revenue, whether it be by uh, examining tax breaks or, um, <clears throat> or addressing other inequities in the state's tax code that uh, more often than not provide advantages to those that can afford to pay more. Um, so uh, with that as background, we are excited to welcome several of the state's experts on key issues that will face Californians in the coming year. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce today's panel. Um, let's see. Essie Hutchville is a policy analyst with the California Budget and Policy Center. Uh, Essie joined the Budget Center in 2017 as a state policy fellow, working on budget and tax policy, as well as issues around income support for families and individuals from low-income households. Anya Lawler is a policy advocate with the Western Center on Law and Poverty, who has spent nearly two decades working in land use and housing policy at the state level. She has extensive exper expertise with housing element law, the regional housing needs allocation process, density bonus law, inclusionary housing policies, anti and anti-displacement anti policy, among others. Kathy Senderling McDonald is the Deputy Executive Director of the County Welfare Directors Association, a role that she has had and served in since 2010, and works to promote legislative budget and policy changes that improve human services programs and delivery of those programs and services. She joined the organization commonly known as CWDA in 2002. And with that, uh, I'm going to start today's conversation by talking a little bit uh, with, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed Ron. I apologize. <laughs> We're here, yes, with a different line up there. I right, thanks for the heads up. Ron, Ron Coleman is the Director of Policy and Legislative Advocacy for Health Access California, which he joined in 2018 and represents California's healthcare consumers in the state capital. He previously worked for the California Immigrant and Policy Center. So, and with that, uh, I'm gonna start off by talking uh, a little bit and sort of setting some context here by asking some questions of Essie um, to sort of set the uh, context about how Californians are doing. So Essie, what would you say um, are some of the key challenges facing Californians in 2020? Sure. Can everyone hear me okay? Is this fine? Great, um, so thank you, Jonathan. 
Um, so as, as you mentioned, and as the Budget Center has continued to highlight this year, uh, California is very much uh, a wealthy state with many high-income households and businesses that have greatly been able to expand uh, their wealth in the past several decades. But at the same time, we know that there are millions of Californians for whom you know, they live a very different economic reality. And that is because we have um, these persistent economic, ethnic, and racial challenges that face our state. So one of the first things that I want to highlight is our poverty rate. So when you account for the uh, cost of living, California has you know, the rather dubious distinction of having one of the highest, and at times the highest, uh, poverty rates in the nation uh, for the past several years. Uh, and uh, in 2018, I believe it was about 17.6%. And when we look at child poverty specifically, we know that you know, about one in five uh, of children in, in our state lives in poverty. And that's particularly um, concerning for children of color because they are more likely than our white children to um, struggle economically uh, with more than a quarter of Latinx and black uh, children living in, in poverty in California. So sort of what's, what's behind that? You ask, what are the key challenges? So one, one key challenge is that most families in poverty are working, but they simply aren't earning enough to actually meet their basic expenses. So as we highlighted recently uh, in our, our Labor Day report, um, for workers who make uh, low and mid, um, mid-wage, mid-wages, their wages have basically stagnated um, since 1979. And so when you have earnings um, that have basically stagnated, um, then you, don't, you basically don't have enough to meet your, your basic expenses, like housing, which is our second key challenge, is the rising cost of housing. We know that uh, the, the growth in median, uh, median household rent has far out, outpaced the growth in um, median uh, annual earnings, even for a full-time worker. So when you have, and we also know that our high housing costs are one of the primary drivers of why we have such a high poverty rate compared to, to other states. And across the state, Californians are paying more than 30% and sometimes as much as 50%, so half of their income is going to, to housing. And what that means is when you're paying that much, you don't you know, have enough, you, don't, you might not have enough left over for adequate food um, to take care of your, your health problems, to afford quality childcare, or even to avoid homelessness. And again, that's a problem with you know, particular equity dimensions because we know that Latinx and black Californians um, tend to have lower wages and tend to uh, struggle more with, with, with housing burdens. So just to sort of wrap it up, um, that basically everything I just said was really, really you know, bleak and dreary and depressing, uh, and I'm sorry, um, but... <laughs> That's the reality that we live in. Um, but I want to sort of uh, note that we can also understand this as an opportunity, um, and you know, not just an opportunity, but you know, a moral obligation that we have, um, policymakers specifically have, to make you know, a real, bold commitment, an actual commitment to the families um, and all Californians in our state who are currently sort of locked out of sharing in that prosperity, but you know, who should be... Um, should be able to better share in it. Thanks for that, Essie. Um, and uh, you have painted a, a pretty uh, bleak picture on some fronts, but at the same time, I think, as you, as you noted, you know, there are opportunities there. And um, so, you know, one of the things that we're hoping that the panel can sort of speak to today is how it is that state budget and policy choices can matter in people's lives, right, and, and help improve people's lives. So uh, can you point to some ways in which recent policy choices have made a difference in the lives of Californians. So thinking about ways in which state budget and policy uh, uh, advocates and others can participate in making Californians' lives improve. Yeah. So short answer is policy definitely matters, which is, you know, great for all of us here. Um, longer answer is um, I want to sort of just highlight um, one, one example, um, which is the, the earned income tax credit. So um, earlier in his presentation, Scott Graves, um, he highlighted sort of how um, the state and the federal budget sort of work together for Californians. Um, and this is a really great example of that. So the federal uh, EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, and also the federal child tax credit we know um, are incredibly effective at uh, reducing child poverty in our state. And the research also shows that when you sort of 
tack on uh, a state EITC uh, along with that, that simply enhances the anti-poverty uh, effects of these tax credits. And you know, good for us, in 2000, about 2015, uh, state policymakers decided to institute um, the Cal EITC, which is a refundable uh, state tax credit that was really geared towards uh, the lowest uh, earning families. And in subsequent years, they've expanded upon that tax credit, um, including the, the Young Child Tax Credit recently that was geared towards uh, families with really young children. And that makes you know, a big difference for us in California because uh, families with kids, particularly uh, kids who are under the age of six, uh, are more likely to live in poverty in our state than in any other state. So if you're thinking about you know, how do you raise a family with children in our state, that decision that policymakers made um, through um, the EITC and the Young Child Tax Credit um, really can boost uh, incomes for, for families significantly. And uh, again, this has... Uh, it also has sort of an equity benefit because we know that women and people of color are more likely to be eligible um, to claim to claim those tax credits. So you know that's that's on the one hand the sort of positive way that that, that um, we've seen policy uh, decisions make a make a difference. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't note that there are, is still sort of room to grow um, in that space. So for example, um, when we think about the Cali ITC specifically, we know that. Um, Immigrant filers who don't have a social security number, but they file their taxes with an ITIN, which is an individual taxpayer identification number, they're currently sort of cut out uh, of benefiting from the Cal uh, EITC. And also, uh, I want to note um, the work of, of caregivers, which you know is, is unpaid, and that's work that's primarily done by women. Uh, it's undervalued, it's un unpaid, but it is, I mean, it's critical to our to our communities. That's you know, the future generation, and it's critical to our economy. Um, so that's sort of, I wanted to highlight, you know, the good stuff um, that we've done and also where we still have, have uh, yet to grow. Thanks so much, Essie. Really appreciate you providing some context for sort of where we stand and uh, how we can make a difference. Um, I'm going to be uh, asking some questions now of the rest of our panelists sort of in rounds uh, and, and start uh, first, by acknowledging the expertise here, we're very fortunate to have a wealth of experience uh, and expertise in issues that uh, face Californians. Um, as a way of helping our audience understand how choices made by the legislature and governor affect Californians, um, I'm going to ask each of you to think about one or two policy priorities or policies that were either advanced last year or were rejected last year and how the outcomes uh, affected the lives of Californians. So uh, let's start with Anya and then we'll, we'll go down the line. Good morning. Um, so I, I'm gonna mention two things. Um, one on the policy side and one on the budget side last year that I think are, are positive steps forward. Um, so on the policy side, um, as folks may recall, there was a bill that made it uh, all the way to the governor's desk and got signed into law, AB 1482, that limits uh, rent increases for about 8 million renters in California. And also, perhaps more significantly, um, requires that landlords actually have a reason to evict somebody, because prior prior to now, that was not the law. You could be evicted from your apartment for any reason. Um, and so thanks to AB 1482, eight million renters across California, not all renters, we, we had to make some difficult political choices in the bill to get it through, and so we, we couldn't capture, for instance, renters who rent single family homes. Um, but most renters in multifamily properties in California now are protected from being arbitrarily evicted. Um, and coupled with that, protected from having their rent raised um, to real gouge level rents. So you can't raise the rent more than 5% uh, plus the consumer price index, which is you know probably about 7 to 8% total. Um, so th this is huge. Um, California, from the tenant perspective, has some of the weakest landlord-tenant laws in the country. I don't think that's well known or well understood. Um, there are stronger laws in a lot of states that we tend to think as being a little bit more backwards, like Mississippi. Um, that's one that always gets shouted out. Mississippi has much greater protections on the books for tenants than California does. But So that was a big step forward because it's been really difficult to change those laws. And, and this law 
is making an impact now and will dramatically, I think, change patterns of evictions that we see throughout California, because now landlords can't simply arbitrarily evict lower income people in order to bring in a higher income tenant who might pay them more in rent. And so that, that, that's a game changer. Um, on the budget side, we saw relatively significant investments last year in uh, both affordable housing and homelessness. And this is particularly notable because we don't typically fund affordable housing in the budget. Um, and so that was a big shift. Uh, the governor put $1.5 billion into the budget for various affordable housing uh, construction programs, an additional $250 million in the budget for local and regional planning to really get cities and regions prepared to accommodate more housing and to do it in a thoughtful way. Um, because we do have a housing shortage in this state, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, in addition, uh, about a billion dollars going into various homelessness programs, most significantly $650 million that's going to go out to cities and counties to help really address the immediate impacts of homelessness, but focused on policies that are going to transition people experiencing homelessness homelessness into permanent affordable housing, um, which has been something sometimes missing from the policy equation. We, we've pumped out a lot of dollars at the local level to address homelessness without a lot of guardrails around it. So, so now that money has to really be tracked to a plan to ensure that the person getting the benefit will eventually be able to access permanent housing that they can afford, which is, which is a positive step forward. So, so th that, that's all good and, and will be impactful. And then I, I think later we'll have a chance to talk about maybe some of the downsides. Great. Thanks, Ron. You know, certainly we were very happy to see what we were able to do under Governor Gavin Newsom this year with health care issues. Certainly in many ways, while Gavin Newsom was running for office during 2018, it was essentially a health care election period. I mean, there was a national debate going on around the ACA. Um, there were congressional members that were drawing a line on the sand on the issue. Many of those congressional members were booted out of office. Um, at the same time, uh, you, uh, many Democrats in the state legislature also uh, were able to take over seats during that time, particularly because of how health care did resonate so much in people's lives. I mean, California is a very expensive state to live in, and often health care costs, no matter how much money uh, in affordability assistance came directly from the ACA, certainly people still struggled to buy health insurance. At times, there were individuals in the Bay Area that may have been in their 50s or early 60s that were paying up to half of their income on premiums to buy coverage in Covered California. So now this year, we were able to see a lot of assistance move forward, particularly uh, a first in the nation program that did provide state funded affordability assistance for individuals buying coverage in Covered California. Uh, certainly for individuals under 138% of the federal poverty level, so think somebody making about sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars $17,000 a year, they will now not pay any money for premiums. They will essentially have premiums zeroed out, which is big. You know, those folks are typically Medi-Cal eligible, but for whatever reason, maybe it's a certain type of lawfully present immigrant or a caretaker that may not have had enough quarters to qualify for health care. Additionally, there was a lot of um, help given to individuals between 400 and 600 percent of the federal poverty level. So think somebody between $48,000 to $72,000. For those individuals, health care was essentially capped to about 10 percent to 18 percent of their premiums. Still high, but certainly not paying 50 percent of their income, which is certainly <coughs> something we were seeing. Some people will get thousands of dollars in state-funded affordability assistance from the state to really help them buy coverage for the first time. Time. For folks that were between 200 and 400 percent, so thinking between 24,000 to about 48,000 dollars, those folks got a modest amount of help, probably about 10 dollars a month. But they do get significant help in um, uh, from the ACA, from the federal government. Still, though, given California's very high costs. Many of those individuals struggle to utilize the insurance they have because of out-of-pocket costs and deductibles. So we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But certainly being able to have a program that now supports more individuals in California being able to buy health care or buy better coverage is certainly something we were glad to see um, with Gavin Newsom. It was something he uh, took charge on and proposed on his first day and backed it up with a commitment in the budget and advocates worked really hard to make the program more meaningful. Additionally, we also saw Governor Newsom move forward a proposal for undocumented young adults. Certainly, we had already 
one kids in California, so all kids had been covered up to age 18. But certainly we do now have a First in the Nation program to cover all individuals between 19 and 25. It is about 138,000 undocumented young adults that would be covered. And certainly this is the start to a broader commitment that the governor has to cover all. Other big things that popped up in the budget last year that will have big benefits for families, particularly low-income families, the optional benefits under Medi-Cal that were done away with in 2009, particularly because of budgetary reasons, not for policy reasons, were also brought back in this last budget cycle, but temporarily only for three years. There was also some outreach and education money uh, in the budget, particularly for individuals, um, for individual community-based organizations that will be supporting enrollment to make sure that we can get more people enrolled. Um, and we also saw uh, continued investments under Prop 56 and also new investments that Governor Newsom made, particularly related to children and also the workforce uh, for providers. And so, you know, it was a, a big year for healthcare. care. However, there, there's more to do that we'll, we'll talk about later. Thanks much, Ron. Thank you. So, I mean, first to say what they said, yay. Um, <laughs> it's batting at the end cleanup here. You can just pull up oh, your mic sure. a little bit. Uh, it doesn't want to pull up there. <laughs> Better? Yo, okay, Yo. people are not, okay, a few people are nodding, so I'll take that as a yes. Uh, so CWDA, the County Welfare Directors Association, you may or may not know, is a pretty broad-based organization. Our members in the 58 counties run uh, child welfare, adult protection, we do eligibility for the Medi-Cal program, CalWORKs, CalFresh, um, in-home supportive services, and then depending on my member, they might be their public guardian, they might run their workforce system. So we get pretty into everything. So I'll, uh, that's why I said, yay, homelessness, yay, health, because those are things that I actually also had, and uh, uh, as well as the EITC. Um, I want to just say what we saw this year was an incredible commitment. I agree. Starting in January, which you don't always see from especially a new administration, to try to address areas of poverty, homelessness, and trauma, and uh, adverse childhood experiences. Those are sort of our three pillars right now that we're looking at all of our policy and budget work through. And so um, I, we'll talk more, I think, about the homeless and housing issues and how they affect and kind of overlap to our programs later. But I definitely want to talk a little bit about the changes that were in the CalWORKs program, which is our um, income maintenance and welfare to work program. The program is intended to lift people from poverty Somewhat. It doesn't provide enough of a grant level um, for small or large families with children to really get them out of poverty. And so two years ago, in the final year of the Brown administration, there was a big discussion that we um, were very much participating in, along with other advocates and legislators, to try to lift the children in Cal is poverty. So as he talked a lot about poverty, one of the things that we've really tried to focus on is that deepest poverty, which studies show are, is so traumatic and has long-lasting effects on children. You probably, a lot of you obviously know that because you're here um, in the right place to talk about those types of things. But what was done um, in that last year of Brown's administration was a commitment over a three-year period to pull up the, the floor of our grants so that no child in a family would be getting less than 50% of the federal poverty level when the, the grants were provided. And what gov we got the first year of that in that last budget year of Governor Brown, and what Governor Newsom came in was he came in and he did the other two years in the January budget. He said, let's just do it now. And so we had expected we might have to have a big conversation about getting that done even to do the second year, and in fact, he went the whole way, and that was really great. Um, so it helped to refocus the conversation on other changes in the program that could be done to further improve people's lives. And the one that I want to mention as a big win was there's uh, when you're on the program, we wanted to make work pay. And so we disregard part of your income. We don't dollar for dollar reduce your grants as you get a job and begin working. You can keep some of that before we start to reduce the grant to recognize that you now have a job. But that was 20 years old. I mean, this program was enacted in 1998, and it had never been increased. It was, you know, $90 plus 50% of the rest. And it was just so outdated. People were dropping off this cliff far before they were able to uh, make it on their own. And at that point, they'd lose child care, which is huge in our state, obviously. And they would end up, um, in some cases, <clears throat> foregoing a raise 
because, you know, people know how to do math and they knew that they would be far worse off if they ended up losing their services, even if their grant was pretty low at that point. And we didn't want to have that happen. So we were able to get through this past year um, a significant increase of the earned income disregard and then indexing that to inflation over time. So we won't have to come back 5, 10, 20 years from now and say, hey, we're way outdated again. We're going to try to keep up pace with the cost of living. So the grants um, will re remain in effect and people's eligibility will remain in effect longer and it'll shallow out on a longer pathway. So we're really happy about that in the poverty um, arena. The other thing that we really appreciated was the governor's commitment to dealing with trauma and adverse childhood experiences. Um, again, in the last year of the Brown administration, we co-sponsored legislation so that every child in Medi-Cal would get trauma screenings at the same sort of points in time where they were getting other um, tests and checkups done, there's something called a periodicity schedule that's a national thing that sort of says, here's when children at these different ages should get a hearing screening, a vision screening, that sort of thing. Well, a trauma screening had not been part of that. And so that's now been added in, and, and the work has been going on to figure out what is that screening tool, how will that actually be used, and what the governor did last year was propose funding to actually implement it, to train providers, doctors, uh, social workers, you know, people who would be expected to not only administer but also understand the results of those screens. And and he proposed money. The other thing he did was appoint the Surgeon General, our, our first ever Surgeon General, uh, Nadine Burke Harris, who if you, you know, five million people, so at least a few of you in this room have seen her TED Talk about trauma and ACEs and how that affects children and ongoing effects on adults. And we've been all in on that issue for some time and have really found a good partnership, I think, with her and are looking forward to doing a lot more work in this area because it doesn't just affect children in foster care. It affects parents on CalWORKs. There's so many cyclical issues. So those are the two that I would like to mention. Great. Thanks so much for, for giving us some sense of how last year went. Uh, what I'm going to be turning to now is sort of what we might expect in the coming budget year. Um, and uh, as many people know, the legislative analyst came out with a report recently that talked about budget surpluses. Uh, and But at the same time, uh, there's a, a fair amount of, of talk of being uh, circumspect about these surpluses. And in the analyst report as well, mentioned that despite there being a $7 billion surplus, really would not suggest doing more than any, more than a few billion dollars or actually $1 billion in um, in ongoing spending, um, but it, it relates to that, there's uh, uh, possibly going to be some one-time spending that's uh, sort of prioritized in the coming budget, uh, in the budget negotiations. So what I was thinking is, is maybe you could talk a little bit about where you might see opportunities in terms of how to use one-time spending in given areas that are of concern to you. So maybe you start with Anya. Uh, Sure. Do you want do you want us to before we do that? Do you want us to talk about what we see coming this year, or mm. what order should we do these things? In? Sure. I mean, you um, you know, sure. If you wish to mention sort of what you think is coming <laughs> down the pike, by all means, it was okay. sort of. Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start by setting a little bit of context because I I, I talked about some of the good stuff we saw in the budget uh, last year, and 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 like my fellow panelists, I I I, I uh, feel frankly a huge sense of relief to finally have a governor who is really committed to digging in on poverty and some of the drivers of that in California. It's it's a real breath of fresh air and in the housing context. Um, the previous governor, who was fantastic on many many other issue areas, really saw the housing crisis as intractable and not really the state's problem, and that was really challenging. So having Newsom come in and prioritize this issue has, has been really exciting, um, and it was exciting to see significant funding come in through the budget, but I want to put that funding in some context. Um, the state has seen a decline in state and federal investment for affordable housing of about 70% in the last decade, 70%. It, it, it's huge. Um, so what we're seeing now, the astronomical increase in homelessness um, it, it is entirely predictable. Um, and I should note that even in 2008, the funding was not adequate. Um, and, and, you know, and right about that time is when we lost redevelopment, which brought in about a billion dollars a year in funding uh, for affordable housing in the state. Uh, federal funding continues to decline. And so, you know, Although the leap forward uh, last year was, was 
great and it will bring a lot of units online, it's going to run out quickly because it's just woefully inadequate given the scale of the crisis. Um, and another thing I want to mention on that is that most of the state's affordable housing funding programs um, produce units that are affordable to people in the low income bands. So in, in the affordable housing world, we talk in income bands. Um, and we peg that to uh, the area median income in the county in which somebody lives. And so, for instance, somebody in the low income band has an income between 50 to 80 percent of the area median income. Uh, very low is 30 to 50, and uh, extremely low income uh, is below 30 percent of MI, just so you know what I'm talking about. So, uh, most of our affordable housing funding programs in California fund units affordable to people in that 50 to 80 band, the low income. and, and some very low income. Uh, almost none of the units that are going to get produced by the dollars that we have flowing now are going to be affordable to extremely low income households. California does not have a funding stream dedicated to serving extremely low income households. Not surprisingly, a lot of those households end up falling into homelessness. Uh, it's very predictable. Um, and so, you know, the, while there's good news, we, we are far from actually solving the problem. You know, and historically, we have looked to the federal government to provide the funding for ELI. Why? Because it's very, very expensive. As you can imagine, the deeper, you know, the deeper the affordability level, the higher the subsidy cost or the higher, you know, the, 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 um, the rent support that somebody needs, right? It's, it's pretty basic math. And, and the federal government obviously has access to substantially more financial resources than states. And so, uh, that's what we would like to see happen. We would like to see the federal government step up, but unfortunately what we see is the federal government stepping back continually. They're not increasing the number of vouchers we have in California. We have maybe 450,000 vouchers of various types. 300,000 of those are going to be Section 8 vouchers. Um, 100,000 of those are project-based Section 8, which are those that are tied to a building and a smattering of other vouchers. Um, that is woefully inadequate for the number of people who actually qualify for vouchers. We don't really do this in other areas. Like, you know, if you are a low-income person and you cannot afford your energy costs, you're going to get a notice from your energy provider and they're going to say, you can qualify for this program we're going to give to you. We don't do that with housing. We say, you qualify for a voucher, good luck getting one. We don't, we don't actually deliver on, on the promise that those programs are supposed to provide. And the federal government clearly isn't going to step up anytime soon. And so it may be time for the state to think about how can we support extremely low-income folks in affording housing, whether that's through actual production of those units, through deeper subsidies available through some of our funding programs, maybe it's through rent subsidy program, a statewide voucher program, um, simply, frankly, getting more income into the pockets of ELA households to help them pay rent. These are all potential options. Um, and, and frankly, to your question of one-time funding, sure, we could do that with one-time funding. Um, you could put one-time funding out and um, cities or housing providers can create what's known as a capitalized operating reserve that they can tie to a low-income project that can draw down the cost of those rents to extremely low-income households. That is something you can actually do with one-time funding and then have that run for 15 to 25 years to at least ensure that people can afford those units for that spend of time while we figure out something else. We can put construction dollars out on the street. We can, we can do a whole host of things with one-time funds. So there, there definitely are opportunities out there. Um, and, and frankly, the way we're treating affordable housing funding is a constant one-time thing. We don't have a lot of permanent funding sources from that. We have uh, a bill that, that Senator Atkins passed in 2017, um, created a permanent source of funding for affordable housing in California, which sounds very exciting, but through the wonders of the slicing and dicing and sausage making in the legislature, the value of that is only about $250 million a year. It's not a whole lot. Um, and, and so it, there's not a lot of money. And then we have the, the state and federal low-income housing tax credit programs, which are effectively permanent, right? They could be taken away, but we don't like to take away tax credits. So those bring in a lot of money, but it's, it, it, it's not adequate. And everything else is constantly one time. And so, you know, the affordable housing community knows how to work with one-time funds. We'd much rather see ongoing funding, of course. Who wouldn't? But we'll take it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah. Ron, thoughts about where we should be thinking about looking forward? Yeah, I think my knee-jerk reaction to the, the final part of the question related to, to one-time funding is, is somewhat difficult. I mean, I certainly think that with healthcare, there are things you can do as it relates to outreach with one-time funding that can definitely get people enrolled and, and make sure that we're 
targeting the right communities to um, enroll in various healthcare programs that are available to them. But, you know, healthcare coverage, it costs money and it's ongoing. It's, it's, it's something that costs into perpetuity. And so, you know, for the Brown administration at times, you know, he saw healthcare as a bottomless pit, which is why he wasn't as proactive on this issue. But uh, Governor Newsom certainly sees the value in everybody in the state having health care. Uh, certainly coming out of the budget, there was also the Healthy California for All Commission that will move forward. However, you know, advocates don't necessarily want that space to be an impediment to things that we can absolutely do now, given the fact that we do have a surplus, and then also the natural growth of the budget. Certainly, uh, last year, and again, it doesn't, it is um, um, very important to note that, you know, there will be those 1 million people that will get that additional affordability assistance. There was the $1.5 billion that was invested over three years as part of the money put in for affordability assistance with the individual mandate. However, there's a lot more to do for individuals that are still struggling to buy insurance. Particularly, last year we didn't do anything at the state level to impact individuals between 138% and 200% of the federal poverty level about $17,000 to $24,000 a year. For those individuals, they're expected to pay about 2% to 6% of their income that scales up under the ACA. However, you can imagine if you're making $17,000 a year, $12 an hour, $2,000 a month, coming up with $200 a month for a premium could, could be really expensive and, and potentially impossible for, for individuals. We also know that 50% of individuals under uh, $24,000 a year are essentially also buying bronze coverage. And so, you know, um, we want to do more for individuals that are stuck in bronze coverage that have very expensive deductibles. Yes, they have coverage, but if you're making $24,000 um, if you're making even $48,000, um, you know, paying a $6,000 deductible is a barrier to coverage. And so can we move forward a proposal to get folks between 200 to 400% down to zero deductible? I guess increasingly here we also want to do more for premium assistance for those between uh, $17,000 and um, uh, $24,000 as well. Lastly, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we did do a lot for premium assistance for individuals that are roughly making between $48,000 and $72,000, but they're still paying uh, at uh, premiums that are capped at 10% to 18% of income. 18% of income. I don't think I think all of us would agree in this room. That's that's high. Um, so we want to do a little bit more for individuals that are between um, uh, 400 and 600 as well. So, uh, you know, there's a lot more we can do with affordability assistance to make sure that more people are buying coverage in Covered California. Uh, additionally, and, and one, one note on that just for context setting as well, I mean, when the ACA came to California, before the ACA, uninsurance in California was about 18 to 20 percent. The ACA cut the uninsurance rate in half. Right now, we're sitting at about 7%. And so to get it down, we need to do more on the affordability front. But the other thing we need to do is figure out how we're going to cover undocumented immigrants. And so we have 2 million undocumented immigrants in the state of California. About 1 million are eligible for Medi-Cal. We have kids that are covered. Starting in January, we'll have young adults. So that's roughly about 140,000 kids roughly about 140,000 young adults. We're now up to about 300,000 individuals. And so we still have adults, though. There's, there's a huge population of people that are left out. Particularly next year, we do think that Governor Newsom will move to seniors as a next step. Um, certainly, uh, Health Access, California Immigrant Policy Center, and many other organizations moved to SB 29, a Durazo bill, with AB 4 and an Arambula bill. But uh, Senator Durazo was able to get a commitment from the governor to work with the legislature on moving seniors in this next budget. So we'll have to wait and see if seniors is a part of uh, his announcement, we expect it to be. And if it's not, SB 29 is ready to be taken up on the assembly floor. And so after seniors, though, we do have a challenge to figure out how we cover all. And so that is something we're still looking at. But considering that we do have natural growth within the Medi-Cal budget, we're looking at funds that we can capture to continue along the lines of that expansion. And certainly that will also be uh, part of the discussion within the Healthy California for All Commission as well. Hi, okay, my turn. So I think one of the things that I think a lot about as I hear my colleagues talk is about how intertwined 
all of this is because I could talk for five minutes just on sort of the housing pieces or the health pieces, as well as thinking more about the sort of purely social services pieces, because so many of those families have the same issues. They cross over the health care need, the, you know, anti-poverty, putting food on the table. There may be involvement in the APS or CPS system. There's a caregiver providing care through IHSS or having housing insecurity or facing eviction. Um, so it's really all intertwined. So when we see these efforts in the housing area or in covering additional members of the household, Ronald, I'm thinking about your 17,000, you know, kind of group that you're talking about, um, those those are families whose children are typically eligible for Medi-Cal. We go up to about 200% for kids, but when you think about their parents not having that coverage or having to kind of make a really rough decision about what to do with that coverage, we know that when parents are covered, children are more likely to actually make it to the doctor for preventive care. And so again, it interconnects about how that works out. So for them to get that trauma screening I mentioned, they actually have to go to the doctor. And if the parents aren't covered, they're less likely to. So you see it snowball. And so having all of these things covered is all, it can be daunting, I think, for the legislature and the administration to figure out how to balance all of that, but it's certainly a balancing act that they have to do. Two things that I want to hit on um, for reals are, well, three maybe, is there is some unfinished business on CalWORKs. The shifting nature of our engagement with our welfare to work population, we typically for years, our counties would say, um, well, go to, go to work first, go test the job market, see how you're doing. And if it doesn't work out after a few months, come back and we'll put you in a training program. I mean, that's a pretty high sort of level nutshell of a lot of approach. And what we found is that the jobs that people can get are pretty crappy. I mean, these are shift work. Their shifts are all over the place. So it makes childcare difficult to receive. And so thinking about how to get people into training, into education, and really supporting those things so that they can get a better job that actually has a pathway out of the poverty and into self-sufficiency is becoming really important. And, and doing so in a way that's based on goal setting in a collaborative conversation rather than, you know, here's a paper full of choices you'll pick one or pick two and we'll add up to the number of hours you have to do or else you're going to get sanctioned. And so we're really trying to shift um, through work that we've done with Mathematica out in the counties over the last few years from what we'd say kind of CalWORKs 1.0, which I've described, to CalWORKs 2.0, which is this much more collaborative uh, relationship. Some things that need to change for that is to um, think about how we're funding our services, how we're serving people. Those are possible budget discussions certainly policy discussions that could potentially lead to legislation, as well as trying to undo some changes that were also done around 2009, also due largely to fiscal constraints like the health um, coverage that Ronald mentioned, where we instituted uh, like all these extra timelines and we dropped our um, ability to stay on the program from 60 months to 48 months, which just isn't enough time for so many people to get stable and really get on that right pathway. So I think you'll see some discussion around that. Um, as well in the... Um, I know on the health side, and we could do sort of an hour and a half on just this, there's um, waivers that have to be renewed. Both our 1915B um, waiver, which is our specialty mental health waiver that carves out um, the um, deeper diagnoses and provides that to the counties to provide, as well as our um, 1911 waiver. Did I just get the note? I just blanked. Yeah, and so um, that one expires this year as well, and that co kind of covers everything else, like um, as well as some behavioral stuff, and that's going to be a big discussion, and there has been no discussion to date about the fiscal related to that, and in talking with DHCS, they've said, yeah, that's going to be a budget discussion, and the feds are not going to provide the same kind of funding that they did for our prior waivers. They're, they've changed how they do their funding, and we don't have as much federal dollars to play with. So the state is going to probably be expected to put in some general fund, which will be, uh, at least for a long time, they haven't done that. They've used county expenditures. They've used um, health plan or public health expenditures, public hospital expenditures to make up the match. And so having a discussion around how much do they want to peel off and put toward that waiver is going to be a big deal because obviously that could be important stuff, but also there's an opportunity cost with doing that. Um, and then just finally, sorry, I really want us to think about the federal government and how just the assault on the programs that we run and the people that we serve um, 
I mean, the immigration stuff has made people scared to come in. We fully and strongly support these expansions, and we're, you know, trying to figure out how to combat the possible fear, just of information possibly being shared, even though largely that doesn't happen. There's always a chance, and so how do you message that? How do you talk to people? Um, as well, there's a huge, um, just several issues around SNAP, which is our CalFresh program. Um, you may have read just this week, um, last week there was a new reg finalized that certainly will be held up in the courts, as all of these things have so far. But what if the courts decide, yeah, okay, go ahead and implement that. We're going to have to scramble. It's going to be more costly on the administration side to implement a lot of these things. And we'd much rather have those funding, that funding go to benefits. These are folks who need them. And so it's very frustrating and I think should be probably a, at least a consideration in this, you know, kind of keeping it in the back of our heads, that that's something that would be would make choices about whether to backfill some of that and provide some state-only benefits. And so that could come up as well, depending on those court cases. So, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I was going to be asking about sort of federal questions, and so I appreciate you Big bringing way. that up. But I, I think one of the things I'm also <laughs> sort of curious about is whether, you know, given your experience with the legislature and sort of in helping to try and provide information to members and their staffs, um, you know, the, the recent blueprint came out. Um, it's often a very high level um, in terms of what it is priorities are being set forth. I'm curious if you might uh, speak about what you might either think is being thought of in the building at this point in terms of priorities, um, building out on either what is in the blueprint or what, you know, that, that, that broad framing, um, or uh, also what might be happening on the Senate side in terms of anything that you're hearing at this point. I mean, we're waiting, of course, for the budget proposal from the governor, but in the meantime, I, um, I'm curious to know what you might be hearing from in terms of legislative priorities coming up in the coming cycle. Anybody want to take that first? Um, so, you know, the Assembly's budget bl blueprint, at least the way I read it, seemed to indicate that there was not support, in, at least uh, from the Assembly budget side, for additional um, funding for affordable housing or homelessness. Uh, I believe it said that the priority there would be to implement the existing resources. Um, so obviously that was a little bit disappointing to see. Um, although, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that that's the end of the conversation. I, I you know, as I mentioned earlier, the governor had um, some significant funding for homelessness in the budget last year, and we would expect to see um, that funding at least continue, and I would expect to see some additional funding for affordable housing as well, although probably not to the scale that we saw it last year. Um, so, you know, it's not all great news, <laughs> um, but, you know, there, there's, I think, uh, I think there's some hope out there, and I, I just, you know, the affordable housing um, community, so the folks who represent the developers that build affordable housing, as well as folks who, like me, who represent people who need affordable housing, um, collectively came together and, and brought in a budget ask to the governor, um, dutifully, uh, to, to really stake our claim on, on what we really need. And that budget ask was for $5 billion, um, which sounds like a lot because we don't typically fund affordable housing through the budget. Um, and yet we thought it was really important to bring in a number that was what we thought was actually needed versus what we thought was real. Um, and that included money for affordable housing construction, um, including extremely low income, um, which would be new, uh, for preservation of both existing deed-restricted affordable housing because those deed restrictions eventually expire unless we bring more money to bear to continue them, um, and then also to preserve what we call naturally occurring affordable housing um, and, and to address homelessness and to do a whole variety of other things. Uh, now, obviously, we know that's an aspirational number, um, and we fully expected the reaction we got, which is like, yeah, right, $5 billion. But I do want to note something, and this gets at something you mentioned earlier about um, where we can find additional resources. Conveniently, $5 billion is also another number we see in the budgeting process, and it happens to be the number that is the single biggest state expenditure on housing. Does anybody know what that is? It's the mortgage interest deduction. Guess who gets the mortgage interest deduction? It's people who are higher income and largely white. Um, that shouldn't shock anybody. So we're making a policy choice to prioritize subsidizing housing for people like me over 
people who are struggling and poor and largely people of color. That is a policy choice we're continuing to make as a state, and we don't have to. We could take that $5 billion and spend it to support people who actually need the support. I will happily give up my mortgage interest deduction to make sure that other people can afford housing. But that's a tough conversation. Now, I'm not saying we're teeing up that fight this year. It's an election year. We know better. Um, okay. But I just think it's worth noting that that's a dynamic that, that, that's playing out, and I think it's important to think about. And at the federal level, not surprisingly, that is also the biggest housing expenditure we have. So it's not for affordable housing at all. It's, for, it's to subsidize higher income people. Um, and then I'll pass it on. And yeah, I think, I think one big outlook for leadership for us that we're looking at is what's really going to happen with the MCO tax. Um, certainly, legislators passed an MCO tax last year, um, and you know some of that is all pending on an approval from the feds. And so there was also a proposed rule change from the feds on how MCO taxes and hospital quality insurance fees can work. And so I think that there's a lot of questions we're trying to, to figure out about what may actually be on the table. So fingers crossed on that. With that said, though, I think you know it is an election year, and you know we are hearing from a lot of members that. They're hearing from constituents about how much they're still struggling to pay for health care. And so we absolutely do expect bills to emerge again on the affordability issues and also be a conversation within the budget. Uh, certainly, there's a lot more work to do, as, as we mentioned earlier there. Um, additionally, I think cost containment is going to be a big issue, potentially. We'll have to see where that issue goes. The governor continues to mention it. He mentioned it on day one and is swearing in. He has mentioned it at many different times when he's spoken about health care. But certainly, you know, given how out of control costs are within health care, what can we do to make sure that health care spending doesn't continue to wildly outpace wage growth and inflation? Because people are just struggling to buy health care, and we need to be able to figure out the cost to make sure that we can figure out how we cover everybody. And so we'll have to see if that continues to resonate as an issue and what we may see around hospital consolidation, what we may see around surprise bills. Maybe we'll see something at the federal level in the next two weeks. Uh, but if not, you know, what we'll continue here in California around surprise bills. What can we continue to do here in California around prescription drugs? as well. I think certainly we saw a bill that the governor signed around pay for delay last year, but we also know that some of California's past efforts around transparency, particularly SB 17, maybe we can enhance them and see if we can do a little bit more. And so I think, you know, what we're hearing generally is that costs are a big thing that legislators want to tackle and then also uh, making sure more individuals can actually afford health care and be covered. So I think we'll, we'll hope to see more as it relates to covering the undocumented, more on affordability, and then also what comes out of the cost containment conversation. Um, so a couple thoughts on this. I do think kind of from a big picture perspective, you're going to see um, a couple things. I think the $1 billion in one time is, um, I mean, God bless the LAO. I worked there when I first started here, but come on. Um, they're going to spend more than that, and it's not going to be one time. As my boss would say, it's all one time till the next time. And um, in our area, that's, of course, a big thing. I mean, how do you raise a grant? I mean, how do you fund affordability? And Oh, but just for you this one year. I mean, it just it's not like that. There was a lot, and I think you alluded to it, this three-year thing that they put in a lot of this stuff, um, that, or maybe Essie mentioned that, where – they, they, they came up, the administration came up with this language that they asked for that essentially sunsets, in a way, a lot of the big ticket items and even some of the smaller ticket items in our area that we were like, why do you want that and that? It's $10 million. But unless there's kind of an assessment and a decision to continue, I think it's sort of guarding against that potential recession and sort of saying these are things that would automatically kind of require that. And then speaking of a potential recession, I mean, the, uh, certainly Governor Brown was Mr. Doomsday about that. Um, Governor Newsom, less so, though, he definitely talks about it. I mean, it's kind of part of his, his stump speech, I guess I'd say, when he has these conversations with people that I've seen. Um, but sort of how much are they going to propose to put away as sort of a rainy day or reserve type of thing? Um, and that's always a push-pull 
with the legislature because you want to be fiscally prudent, but we've got a lot of money in that reserve right now. And in the rainy day fund um, that was required under the Brown administration, um, they're pretty well funded. I mean, you could always use more money in your bank account, but um, how much do you live for tomorrow when you don't quite know when tomorrow is coming versus live for today? So I think that's going to be a real balancing act that you'll see. And as we get closer to what people think, oh, it's going to happen sometime soon, you know, as we kind of get toward and the years go on, I think you get more of that kind of happening. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. That said, I do think you'll see um, more discussion around the EITC and the two areas that um, SE mentioned. I think the legislature um, seemed pretty annoyed last year about how that went down and um, would want to try to add in the ITINs and the caregivers. Um, there's always quite a commitment around child care and early childhood education that I think hasn't been fully fleshed out or kind of worked through. So I think you'll see that as a as sort of a plank um, that they stand on. And then um, sort of generally to two other areas is kind of wrapped into the EITC and the federal stuff that I mentioned, an ongoing look at how can we support immigrants better in our communities. Um, and some of that could be one time, you know, funding for additional attorneys who could help with those types of issues. In particular, I know um, the Department of Social Services, someone's here in this room who works there, um, and so she knows this, is um, there's funding both for sort of general immigration attorney assistance and then also some that's made specific on the public charge issues where they, they take some extra training, like these are really complex. And so there could be some area, I think, some room for some additional maybe small investments in that area. And then finally, I do think, um, especially in talking with the assembly, there is a consideration of some of that unfinished business and Cal work and trying to, you know, like I mentioned, move some of that forward. I do think there's support um, in the legislature for that kind of conversation as well. Again, not really one time though. So thanks. Thanks for that. Um, so uh, before we open it up to questions from the audience, I do have one uh, one question I was hoping to sort of uh, surface with, with each of you about what's going on in the federal side of things. So, um, you know, I know we mentioned a, a bit about that in each of your responses, um, but uh, let's start with Anya. You know, federal the federal government has focused on sort of California's homelessness issues and uh, in ways that I don't think are quite appropriate. But at the same time, um, how do you how do you see the state sort of um, reacting to that in terms of what might be coming in terms of what might be coming from the federal government is there anything that the state can be doing in terms of what the feds may be or may not be doing on that front um, yeah I mean uh, we all know how bleak the federal picture is and I mean just in, in recent news um, which folks may be aware uh, the Trump administration uh, fired Matt Doherty, who has long been the head of the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. The tiny bright spot there is that Governor Newsom wisely snapped him up as a consultant to California, which is great, um, um, but has now appointed a homeless czar who is, you know, truly part of, you know, the administration's parade of horribles, who has really horrible opinions about people experiencing homelessness and, and, and how to address that issue. Um, and, 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 and that's really concerning. Um, and obviously all kinds of attempts to change all sorts of rules um, that are frightening people who are undocumented, that are uh, really have the potential to, to undermine years of hard work that we've done to um, for their fair housing goals and, and do all sorts of other things. But we can, we, I think there's a lot we can do at the state level um, to, to push back on all of that. I mean, I think that uh, homelessness is, I think, gonna continue to be a very hot topic in the legislature this year. Um, and I think, uh, you know, by passing good policies that really reject the notion that I think is being peddled by the federal administration that somehow the solution to homelessness is more criminalization, warehousing of people out of view because it's inconvenient, um, things that actually really look at what the data and research shows us about how we actually can solve homelessness on the long term, passing positive policies that really center the, the humanity of people front and center, I think is the way we push back on what the federal government is doing. And, you know, I mean, I have my concerns in that department. Um, you know, I think people have seen the ballot measure that was put forward by former state assembly member Mike Gatto, which really whiffs of criminalization um, and really not database approaches to homelessness. And, and I do worry um, that those sorts of things sound good to people who don't really know what the data and research tells us. Um, 
And that's, that's a really big, real big concern. But I think there's also, I mean, I will say I sit on the, the governor's homelessness advisory council, and there's been a lot of really excellent, thoughtful conversation at that table about, you know, what what are the real solutions um, and what do we actually need to do to address homelessness? Um, and I will say, too, you know, I, I think a lot of times when we talk about solving homelessness, uh, maybe not us because we're all policy wonks, but sort of people writ large, what they're really talking about is street homelessness, chronic homelessness, the visible homeless. That's really only a tiny fraction of the homeless population, though. Um, and, and, you know, to solve homelessness writ large, it becomes a resource issue, right? The vast majority of people who experience homeless really just need more financial support to achieve stable, supportive, or stable affordable housing over the long term, um, which is why it's so crucial uh, to get the affordable housing funding and that ELI funding in particular, right? Because that prevention is crucial, right? We don't end street homelessness. We don't end chronic homelessness. We don't end any of those things if we're also not preventing people from falling into homelessness in the first place. So I think we have to keep acknowledging that reality and keep pushing for that funding, even though it's perhaps not likely to come in the budget this year. I think the conversation has to stay front and center. And I, I, I think it's going to be a fight. And I'm hopeful that everyone in this room will be part of that fight. Ron, uh, actually, I, I was going to ask you a question about uh, sort of what's going on at the, at the national level. So, you know, we hear a lot of talk about single payer. Um, we hear at the national level, we're obviously in a presidential campaign uh, where there's various conversations going on. Um, but when we think about it at the state level, you know, should, should California be moving towards, uh, you know, a, a single payer model? Or, and if so, what are the state level options that are around this year, what, 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 would, what would you say uh, the state should be doing as relates to these discussions? So I, I think a couple of things. I, I, so, so one thing is single payer and universal health care, Medicare for all, this means something different probably even to a lot of us in this room. And so I think what I, how I'll answer this question is that I think what we've heard from Gavin Newsom is that he's absolutely wholeheartedly committed to single payer. He's also made sure that there's a Healthy California for All uh, commission. Um, Health Access Executive Director Anthony Wright is going to be part of that conversation. Um, I think that certainly um, Health Access supports single payer as an option. Um, it, it is certainly something that would get us to a better place for coverage uh, in California, but it's not something that we can just turn the page on today and reform in a large way without creating a big political challenge um, with legislators, but also um, a mess of how even the health industry stakeholders would engage in that conversation. With that said, I think as, you know, uh, supporters of single payer and health advocates generally and uh, the health industry works together, we are trying to figure out creative ways to get more people covered as the state investigates the different options on the pathway to single payer. So as the Healthy California for All Commission will be charged to think about how California can take those steps, we really do want to see what we continue to do to make gains, particularly for immigrants, continue to make gains around um, affordability uh, with coverage uh, in covered California, but also what can we do to make coverage for employment coverage uh, more affordable as well? I think, you know, really looking at the different ways that we can uh, move forward the healthcare coverage conversation without just flipping that switch and, and making that big change is probably the best we can do right now, especially even given the political challenges we have uh, with making changes at the federal level that will even allow California to be able to move forward with a single payer. I think certainly the other thing that the state of California is looking for is a federal partner to change uh, what California can actually do um, to have a single payer policy in place. And right now, given the Senate's makeup federally, that isn't something that we, we see happening. With, with that said, though, I mean, certainly, you know, we are keeping our eye on the federal government. Um, there's continued sabotage as it relates to the ACA. They have done away with the individual mandate. We've reestablished it here in California. Trump administration has allowed a number of uh, junk insurance plans move forward um, as well, which are now even uh, in, intruding in the California marketplace. Um, you know, I, 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 at the end of the day, you know, the various approvals we need for whether it's uh, various waivers that are coming up, the MCO tax, we're very connected to the federal government as it rela it's related to health care. There's also the court case that's still moving forward around the AC. A need for more is first. 
that what will happen in the case coming out of New Orleans, but it is the Fifth Circuit and we are uh, concerned and we don't think it particularly could go our way. But And, and we do would expect potentially it to, to be taken up to the Supreme Court as well. And, and that could certainly have implications on the California state budget in the future. But definitely things we're watching but and, and hopeful that we can fend off. Uh, but, but as it relates specifically to single payer, really keeping the work going here in California uh, to do what we can do to continue to build on coverage, which is uh, conditioned upon the ACA being in place uh, and making those improvements that will support Californians um, becoming more healthy. Happy. Um, so you are the one who kicked off uh, sort of the issues of what's going on you, you, in federal land uh, that the Trump administration's, you know, recent actions uh, as relates to food assistance. Um, just can you speak a little bit more about what California might be able to do uh, to ensure that uh, those in the state who uh, need food assistance can get it? Yeah. So um, a lot of it. Okay, it's tricky because so many of these programs, to the extent that someone loses eligibility over a change in the rule, they're, they're pretty strict, especially in the SNAP or CalFresh program, the USDA regulations you have to follow or they're going to not give you the money. So the, it's tricky because it's difficult to create a lot of state-only programs in the CalFresh uh, area. But I do think that we have some changes that we could think about making that would allow people to enter the program more easily or more in a more streamlined way or stay on the program to begin with. And those include some changes in just our approach to implementing existing federal policy that's not at risk of changing from a, you know, all of these different uh, requirements. And um, for example, kind of streamlining the process of verifying information that people give us, um, we go further than the feds need to, that the, than the feds require, and that's not fully being attacked. There's some on the margin um, changes that we would have to make if certain regs are finalized and not held up in court, um, as well as um, thinking about how we force people to report. Right now we're in what's called a semi-annual report where people file a uh, report six months in and then they have to do an annual renewal. There's some flexibility that we have around that that other states have taken. So I think trying to make sure that we're doing what we can at a policy level, at a practice level locally, to bring as many people in and make it as simple as possible to stay on is a piece for us to be able to push back, kind of use that flexibility that's there. As well, um, the one that just came out last week, which is targeting the able-bodied adults without dependents or ABODs, the, the crux here, there's sort of two things that we can think about. One is um, right now we in California have continued to be under a pretty broad waiver of work requirements that are in that program. If you are not under this waiver, your ABODs have to um, be working a certain number of hours or, uh, or they could have a disability, you know, that sort of thing. There's some exemptions. And or they lose their coverage. They can only get three months and 12 months. So it's pretty harsh. Other states, I don't know, if, I can't say all, but most other states have, because of the good economy, already lost their waivers. And they've been under that rule um, for, for now a few years. We have the Bay Area primarily and that we've brought in that you just can't make an argument that they have surplus labor anymore, but um, the rules would be tightened up significantly under the federal um, requirements. But um, a lot of things would make more investments into trading programs, uh, subsidized employment in that area. We do have a program called the uh, CalFresh Education and Training Program, and participation in that can help you toward these requirements. So we do that. I think we have to make really judicious use of, we have these um, exemptions that we can give to people for really no reason, like you don't have to have some unemployability or disability. Um, we have a lot of those. And so thinking about how we could utilize those in the best way possible to try to continue giving benefits to people. And those would be things that the federal government would allow and don't change with this rule. So um, hopefully no feds are sitting around watching this to think about new rules to, to write because I swear to God, we get one every two weeks at this point. 
Um, but those are some things that we have now that we could do here in California. Those would, you know, require some investment, like for the additional services and things. But I do think we haven't fully tapped that now, even under the existing rules. Um, and then finally on that is being really as creative as possible within, should those new rules go into effect around how you get a waiver. They still exist, these waivers that states can apply for, but they're changing, they're making them more difficult and less flexible. But we have, with 58 counties and these different geographic areas, we certainly have a lot that we think should still fit within these waivers. And so working with the state that's pretty good at this at CDSS to, to think about how we can kind of, you know, kind of gerrymander that a little bit still and try to get those waivers approved. So those would be some of the combat back kind of areas to try to preserve this for folks that I see. Thanks so much for that. So um, uh, we are going to open up the uh, microphones for questions from the audience. Uh, for those uh, that wish to ask a question, we would ask, please, that you first make sure you phrase your comment as a question as opposed to a comment. Uh, and keep your questions Thanks, brief. Uh, that would be just one per person, if uh, you wish. Um, and please, uh, if you have any comments, please save them for the end. We can um, have Budget Center staff answer your questions. Um, and please make all sure to answer, I'm sorry, to speak into the microphone so that people who are um, participating via live webcast can hear what it is that you're asking. Um, and with that, uh, any questions out there? And if they're not, I can certainly continue along here with thoughts that I have or questions that we have, or we, we might also have questions that are coming in online. Yeah, we have a question via live stream. It's for Anya. Follow up on, um, do, do the renter protections that you mentioned off the top, do those cover duplexes? Do those qualify as multifamily? Um, yes, there's a minor exception for uh, owner-occupied duplexes. So if the owner occupied the other half of the duplex when you moved in, you do not get the protections of 482. Um, but other than that, duplexes are generally covered. We're here, yes. Yes, the number of uh, items in the budget that were set at three-year timelines. Um, from a historical perspective, is this common? Have we any real history on this? I don't think so. I mean, there's always sunsets. I mean, you think about those more in terms of bills and legislation than you do in terms of the budget. But but that's that, that that's there. What we've seen, I think, previous to that language getting put in, which was new, I don't think that's something we've um, dealt with before, was we might get, for example, our adult protective services, we got a $10 million augmentation for training. And on that one item in the budget, it said that could be spent over three years. So it was considered one time, but they gave us three years to spend it, and then we did get a re-upping of that last year in the everything's one time until the next time vein. We were in the third year of it, so we got more funding. Um, so they might sometimes on specific issues like that give you that time period knowing that at the end of that you're probably going to come back and ask for it, but the standardization of that three-day language and using it across so much of what we saw, at least in Health and Human Services, um, I'm not really sure about the rest of the budget, was, um, I think, unusual. For Anya, what is your take on Opportunity Zone? And if we're <laughs> Opportunity Zones are terrifying um, and really just seem, at least at the federal level, to be a way for very, very wealthy people to make a lot more money, um, largely by going in and gentrifying and uh, areas where low-income people live right now, which will probably fuel California's displacement crisis, which is already significant and, and, and far outstrips anything we see in any other state. And so, I mean, they're, they're a huge concern. Um, and we really hope that eventually California can come up with some um, narrowing of the federal program that will really ensure that rather than sort of being a tool to fuel speculation, they can actually be used as a tool to bring in resources into those communities that will actually support the existing community and give them the resources that they need rather than replacing low-income people of color with, with high-income people. Um, so. oh, I'm sorry, you could just... Sorry, do you expect it to come back with this year? I know that I definitely expect that to come back up this year. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you for your time. Um, I'm a representative from California After School Network. My question is very broad. Um, I'm noting who's not in the room and 
it is uh, panel wise is um, a policy representative or policy analyst from um, the tech companies or big corporations that are also in 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 this dialogue of what's causing homelessness. So do you or do you know anyone or what is going on with working with this field to uh, solve the issue? You're asking what are big companies and tech companies doing to help address the homeless crisis? Um, I mean, the governor has been, I think, meeting quite a bit with tech companies, and we've seen him extricate some funding commitments from companies um, to build affordable housing and, and do other things. But, um, you know, beyond that, I, I don't know how intimately involved they have been, um, but certainly have been following those announcements and I'm eager to find out what specifically those contributions are going to fund because we don't really have a lot of detail on that yet. So. Okay, without seeing any other further questions from the audience. <laughs> hey there, uh, I'm Derek. You can just speak, I'm sorry. Yeah, no there worries. you go. Is this better for you? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, hi, I'm Derek with the Ellie Baker Center. Uh, I was just wondering if you're seeing any kind of um, coordinated action from counties, or at least any leading counties, just one of the experts, primarily homelessness and uh, access to health care. Uh, at Alameda and in Oakland, uh, we do have kind of at the city level and at the county level uh, strategies going forward to address them, but um, they are misguided. Uh, you know, they don't follow the homeless and first model at uh, no works and for uh, health care access, well, I guess they're facing a lot of the same uh, hurdles that everyone else is. But I was just wondering if you see any outliers that are to uh, any kind of coordinated action that's being signaled. I have a couple of thoughts on that. So um, one of the things in both the healthcare and housing area that a number of counties have participated in is something called the whole person care, which was in the waiver that's expiring. And because of the changes in how the feds are funding these waivers, it's not expected to be able to continue. But um, we're talking about how to transition and what role counties might play and some additional ideas. What whole person care has allowed those counties to do, and it's mostly the larger, but some of the smaller counties as well have participated is take target populations that we know um, need extra case management, extra assistance, and then also often there's a housing instability or homelessness for, you know, kind of component to what we need to provide. And most of those programs have done that. They have partnered their um, healthcare focus, and that includes behavioral health, our social services folks are at the table to try to get them onto Medi-Cal, um, keep them on Medi-Cal, get them onto CalFresh and those sorts of things, help them apply for SSI. And then also there's a program called HDAP, which is a housing program that's sort of a bridge program. And the HDAP funds partnered up with this program have helped those counties. Um, I know San Diego is one that has done a lot with that. Um, and Los Angeles also has a pretty uh, robust focus on housing with their, again, their targeted populations that they know have specific other needs as well in multiple areas, healthcare being kind of a big connection to that. So those are a couple that I know that are the larger counties that have done some good work in this area. I also um, forgot, I blanked out on the other thing I was going to say. So um, I might see if Anya has a comment, but... Um, Oh, I know what I was going to say, and that is um, you were talking about kind of county outliers. I wanted to say something about our programs and some things that we've done in our specific programs funded by the state to try to help those targeted populations. So we've got in our CalWORKs program the housing support, but they all sound alike, the housing support program, which has grown from about 15, 20 million in the first year in 2015, up to now close to $100 million, where we provide um, rental subsidies of up to 12 months 
to our families that are experiencing a housing crisis to help them um, ideally either avoid eviction, though there's a lot more that we want to do in that area, or get back into housing once they're already homeless. And we can pair that up with like subsidized employment and other employment services to get, help them get a job. And there's been some really great successes, and most counties are participating in that. We have similar eviction prevention uh, programs or housing uh, first type of model programs in the foster care system as well as our adult protective services. What we found is that if you don't have some kind of housing stability focus, you just aren't going to, like, we're spending money on all these services and people are living in their car. Like, they cannot find a job and really keep that job if they don't have that. Um, and so, like, on foster care, it's, we don't pull a child out of a home just because they're having housing struggles, but when you're trying to reunify a child who's in foster care with their parents, a judge will not let us reunify them to a car or to a couch. They have to have more stable housing than that. So that's the population there that we're looking at. And then similarly, um, adults, elders who are abused and neglected, we don't want them to lose their housing. So doing housing repair, uh, rental assistance, negotiating with landlords and things like that. Um, I think two areas that we really see a need for more is first, the housing stock, because it's just, it's, you, there's so many rules about what we can do with this money. And the, if we have to cut a subsidy after 12 months to a family, it's really hard to find a place that we think they're going to be able to afford going forward, um, is, is one. Um, and then the other is, I sort of alluded to eviction prevention. It's more about rehousing people that are homeless already in these programs. And we really want to think about how we can more broadly use that. There's a lot of research that shows, and you could certainly address this, but um, a lot of things where people lose a job or they have other issues that arise from homelessness, it's not necessarily that first they lose the job and then they become homeless. It's they get ev evicted first and then they lose the job and then they can't find another place to live. And so eviction prevention is a huge part of this, and I do think that that is underutilized. Um, housing First is a really great model, but it doesn't necessarily help with people who are already housed and just struggling to maintain that home. I do think that the eviction rules that you talk about in 1482 will help a lot because people are going to get evicted for any reason now. The landlord doesn't like, you know, your look, or, you know, there's like all these people can just get away with so much stuff and kicking people out. And that's, that's a lot of that is aimed at, at our folks that we serve, just like you're saying. So I think that'll be a big help and more is needed in that area. So sorry, I just talked for like 10 minutes about that, but it's a huge issue that we're struggling with too. Well, and just to piggyback on that, I, I do think one thing, one thing that was talked about a lot about last year, but never really came to fruition, and, and, and there may be another effort on this this year, is um, some statewide funding for right to counsel, um, meaning ensuring that a tenant who is facing an eviction proceeding actually has an attorney, because we see a dramatic change. When a tenant is actually represented, um, they win something like 50% of the time, but when they're not, they they lose like 90% of the time. I, those aren't the right numbers, but it's something like that, right? So it makes a huge difference to have an attorney, and even with 1482, um, those protections are only as good as the access that those tenants have to the information and the representation they need to actually win those cases. And we certainly do anticipate a lot of landlords, um, you know, there are lots of good landlords out there, but there are uh, frustratingly a lot of unscrupulous ones too. And we, we, ex it, we expect a lot of ignoring of the rules, just anticipating that the tenant may not know and, or may not have access to representation. And so we'd really like to find a way to ensure that that everyone actually has access to an attorney when they're facing that kind of proceeding. Um, but it's expensive, and, and we'll see where that goes. So I really apologize. I'm sorry, but we'll have you. So um, thank you again for, uh, sorry, we've run out of time. Thank you again for tuning in and attending uh, this policy perspective series. Lots of good landlords out there, but there are uh, not have access to representation. And so we'd really like uh, Without the support of partners and allies, like you, and uh, so please consider supporting the Budget Center today. You can find remittance envelopes as you leave, as well as opportunities online. And please keep in mind that you can also register for our annual Policy Insights Conference, which is happening this March 9th in Sacramento here at the Sheraton. Um, and also, if you have any further questions or would like to hear more about this and other programs, please feel free to get in touch with us or to stay here and talk with us. And thank you so much for joining us. And please give, us, give our uh, panelists a round of applause.